Welcome to Life on Life's Terms. It's episode 70 with your host, Justin. And, and it's Kenny. <laughs> We're going to get in today uh, about what is the difference between a not-for-profit and a for-profit incorporation? Uh, what is the difference of sole proprietorship, partnership, and a cooperative? When to use a non-disclosure agreement? How to protect your ideas? What does witnessing really do? And why is it so necessary to have a corporate lawyer for your startup? We have Liam Connolly in the studio today but before we get into these topics we have to pay our bills so why don't you take the first shout out away ono poke is a chef driven fast casual restaurant serving hawaii's signature dish the menu features chef curried poke bowls customers can select very various bases for the bowls including fur cake rice quinoa spring salad along with vegetable seasoning and protein options such as the torch miso salmon poke albacore tuna poke and spicy thai salmon poke or you can build your own bowl ono in hawaiian means delicious and that is absolutely fitting for them because that's what it is you can find ono poke at 10142 104 street edmonton or google it they are anywhere our second shout out is for Modern Gravity. It is the best place to relax with their spacious float tanks. If you have not floated, you have to try this. February is always a stressful month. For only $39.99 a month, you can enjoy a float a month and let it all go. Please go to Modern Gravity's website at www.moderngravity.ca. That's Damn. it. Bills are paid. Welcome Liam Connolly at Connolly Law. For all your Canadian will lawsuits, <laughs> Google Liam Connolly. <laughs> I, th I think he said your promo many times. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kenny. We've appreciated it. <laughs> so how are you doing this morning, Liam? Not bad. Not bad. So I've, uh, I'm glad you guys have asked me to come in and talk about some of these things. And, uh, you know, I guess, you know, you give uh, some people my background, like, I, yeah, I am, I am their lawyer. I try to keep them out of trouble <laughs> and, 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 and smack their wrists every now and then. Um, but, uh, yeah, my background is I am a practicing lawyer in Alberta. Um, I actually have a master's in international law and commercial law. Um, my main background actually is in intellectual property law, so that's why they started talking to me about when they started their podcast. Um, I've also done, uh, well, I've been teaching for how many decades now in terms of yeah. business and, you know, startups and people, et cetera, et cetera. So I've been uh, doing quite a bit over the years. So uh, I'm glad you uh, asked me to come in and chat with you folks. Well, I think one of the benefits of having a lawyer on the team, so to say, is uh, for our listeners uh, it's almost as if it's like a free legal cons consultation. I mean, all of these uh, questions come from the wealth of the listeners. Um, so I think that's kind of the beautiful thing about the podcast is that uh, we can plug into some of our connections, get them to come in on the show and uh, talk about why it's so necessary to have a corporate lawyer in your startup, as well as like the first the first question that was asked was, what is the difference between a not for profit and a for profit? You want to break that down for these guys? <laughs> well, and simply put, actually, uh, it's making money. Yeah. So in a corporate, you make money. Yeah. Go, you, you pay out your shareholders. In a nonprofit, well, and depending how you set it up, your money stays internal to the organization for redistribution, reinvestment in it, right? Yeah. So it basically all depends on where the money goes and who gets it. Yeah. So with, um, let's, let's start with the profit, uh, for profit. Most of them are set up as partnerships, corporations, a uh, person doing a sole prop. I'll get into the details of those in a bit. Yeah. With a nonprofit, you can actually set it up as a society. Or in Alberta, we have a really unique little feature called a part nine company. There is still an old Companies Act okay. that is extant in this province. Um, I actually remember having to revive one years ago, and I remember going into the court, and the judge and everybody else had no idea how to do this, and I had to piece it together historically. And I ended up actually giving the, the judge an interesting history lesson of the Part 9 Companies Act. So it was kind of interesting to do that. But a Part 9 company is set up similar to a corporation. But what you do is you actually um, you put one extra line in your articles of incorporation, and that is that you pay, do not pay out anything to any shareholders. Mm -hmm. There are shareholders, but no dividends, nothing ever gets paid out to them. So they know that's the money doesn't go there. It goes back into the organization. So my, my question in that then is, 
So we both uh, have talked before, Kenny and I, about uh, not-for-profit basically having a board of directors, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, So in the Part 9 company, would your shareholders essentially work like a board of directors? Um, They're more like the members in terms of things. So your your Part 9 company is you have the shareholders are the members. They're they're the people who own the the company. Okay. But the thing is, the difference between them and a corporation is with a corporation, you would pay dividends out. Oh, With this one, you never pay any dividends out. They get reinvested into the company. Okay. So part nine companies actually are sometimes used to actually set up foundations. Yeah, yeah, okay. So you get into setting up a foundation. So if you want to set up a, you know, a foundation that will take in monies or however it raises it and wants to keep a structure that has limited liability for its or, you know, the organizers and the executive and all the rest, then you set up a part nine company as opposed to setting up a society where you don't get to cover your ass. <laughs> now, 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 one of the other things, too, that I like to interject at, at this moment is uh, when you're setting up a not for profit, you start off as a not for profit, and essentially your goal is to become a charitable organization. That's right. However, the maturity time in order for that to happen with CRA today is a two year process, two to three year process of showing some sort of uh, money that's coming in and money that's going out. And the big difference between a f- uh, not for pro- uh, not for profit and a charitable organization is a not for profit really can't give you a charitable receipt. That's right. A charity a charity can do that. So where does this uh, uh, the part nine company fit into that to become a foundation? Because a foundation can essentially give you that charity receipt at the end of the day. Well, the similarity between that and on the, on the charity side of things, the similarity is with when you have a setup, um, and it has to do with the objects, mm-hmm. whether it's the objects of the society or objects of the foundation. So they the still o- have to have a charitable purpose, the education, relief of poverty, there sport, yeah, yeah, and these yeah. sort of things, right? Awesome. So, so, so those are the only things that you can actually use in order to incorporate a not-for-profit or a part nine company. Is that yeah. With, okay, yeah. excellent. And it, but it comes down to the objects and, and what you're, you're, you're allowed to do with either the part nine company or the society. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that being said, so part nine company goes to become a charitable society and then to a foundation. You're you're mixing, you're mixing terms. Okay. Okay. This is, this is something that always used to drive me nuts with my students. Okay. So you started talking about part nine company society. They're two separate organizations. They're two separate entities. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So okay. a part nine company is an entity set up as a cor- it it's structured same as a corporation. Okay. With directors, shareholders, but the problem the difference is between it and a normal uh, corporation, a found, um, a part nine company changes one line in the articles that says, "Hey, no, you can't pay dividends out to any of the shareholders." It goes back in. With a normal corporation, you have directors officers, shareholders, yeah, yeah. but you pay dividends. Yeah. Now, a society is an entirely different egg. Yeah. A society is set up under the Societies Act. So maybe maybe let's explain this from, from the perspective of the different legislation that governs each one. Okay. Corporation is, de- is derived under the Alberta Business Corporations Act. A part nine company is derived under the, old, the, the extant still um, section part nine of the Old Companies Act. A society is established under the Societies Act. So each is a creature of its, uh, of its own legislation establishing it. Yeah. So a society, which you mentioned, mm-hmm. is different from a part nine, is different yeah. from a corporation. And at each one, you go to the st- you go to the legislation and it shows you how to structure it, and it shows you each piece of legislation shows you the different um, parts of each company or each organization. Ignorant question. Uh, yep. Yeah. What's a legislature? A, legis- a legislation. Yeah, what yeah. is that? Statute. Yeah, so it's it's like the law. It's the law. Yeah, it's, it's the, the law. law on the books. Okay. Yeah, so, okay. so that's okay. that's how they mandate yeah. uh, what you can and cannot do. Yeah. Okay. Okay? Yeah. yeah. I don't want to have to get into a whole jurisprudence. Uh, that, can we leave that for an entirely other Yeah, we'll, we'll day, leave so. that for, a, for an entirely different show. Yeah, yeah please. <laughs> but um, legislation is, the, you know, is what's on the books. It's the stuff passed by the uh, turkeys. I mean, the MLAs in the legislature <laughs> that create the laws. <laughs> <laughs> Did I just say that out loud? Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, so the uh, so each one is a is a creature of the statute that establishes it. So let's 
do you want to start with do you want to start with keep on the nonprofit and then we'll talk about the profit side and then we'll go into you got it. those ones. Yeah, you got so it. So a society is basically established under the Societies Act. And you do have when you establish it, you have to have certain, you know, establishing who the members are, what the objects of the um, society is, what the uh, the, the mission is these sort of things. And you have to establish and set up your bylaws. And there are specific things you have to put in the bylaws to establish a society. And so, one, let's go through a little bit of those bylaws specificities um, because these are a big thing too for later on, I think, the, the difference between for-profit and not-for-profit. Uh, you do have to say at the end of your bylaws that when you dissolve, if you do dissolve, all of your riches have to go to another not-for-profit or charity that the board decides to gain your riches when you dissolve your society. Uh, and the other thing is, is there's only – your board themselves cannot be paid. They all yep. have to be volunteers. Tears. Yep. That's right. And then and then the society itself, like the group of talent, that your volunteers that you have – they can pay dues if the board so decides. However, those dues have to stay within the entity itself. Yeah. They can't just be passing it out. So, like, yeah. it's very difficult for a not-for-profit to work with a for-profit company in the sense of a not-for-profit giving a for-profit money. Yeah, because what, as I pointed out at the beginning, you know, yeah. when we talked about the fundamental differences, it all depends on where the money goes. That's right. right. Now, you mentioned there one of the issues was, um, you know, a for-profit working with the nonprofit, here becomes the problem in a charitable status uh, issue and yeah. if i've come across this a couple of times with organizations where um the nonprofit decides to do a for-profit event such as say a big conference to make money yeah but the problem is once you get into an area where there's certain commercial aspects of it mm -hmm. Uh, then it colors the entirety of the organization. That's right. And I've come across that actually when it's dealt with some nonprofits and some societies when they've been doing that. And it has to do with uh, the fact that, uh, well, at the time, uh, dealt with some of the issues um, under the FOIP Act and some of the privacy legislation that they weren't covered. And I said, when you start to do commercial stuff, oops, guess where you stepped into? Yeah. Guess where you now have to disclose and, uh, yeah. and all this. And so that's sometimes some of the problems with profit, for profit and nonprofit working together. Mm -hmm. Now, how could you establish something like that? Well, there are other ways of doing this, and you you can start to get into areas where we start to look at um, joint ventures and so, so things like that. Where hang on, but okay. it just <laughs> let me get into the stuff because we can get into areas where you can establish a joint venture. That's one question you haven't asked me about. Yeah. And joint ventures are an entirely different egg where you can actually bring together two disparate organizations, yeah, say yeah. a partnership and a corporation, bring them together for uh, a certain project. Yeah. And you've got ways of doing, you can do it that way, but what you're doing is you're establishing maybe an entirely th a third organization that is just set up for the specifics of that mm. joint venture. Okay. Yeah. So you can make a for-profit and a not-for-profit in a joint venture because when you're at, you can't, so when you said commercial stuff, uh, and that's what, where there's some uh, crossover in for-profit and not-for-profit, the commercial stuff that you said, is that like marketing and advertising for like the event for the non-profit? No, it's the aspect of the making the money. Making yeah. the money. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, now, just a breakdown real quick. So we can go from society to charity, from charity to foundation. Okay. Now, char charity and society are also two separate pieces, yes, right? Yes, they are. Yeah. Society is governed by the Societies Act established in... You know, and that's okay. provincial that's for the most part. That, these are provincial aspects. Yeah. Now, when you talk about charitable... That's now, charitable is that status that is granted federally by CRA. Yes. So you can have a society that has charitable status or a society that doesn't have charitable status, depending on how you set up their objects and whether you can get CRA to agree and give you that charitable status. And uh, you're quite right. It takes a hell of a long time to do it. Yeah. And yeah, you need to be established for two years and basically prove to them what you're doing. Yeah. If you don't do that, you're, you're, you're yeah. going to be spinning your wheels for a while and then you can't then issue charitable receipts, et cetera, which... It makes it much, people, difficult, yeah. much more difficult to actually get donations. Exactly. And it makes it also more difficult to get grants. Because yeah. a lot of grants want you to be a charitable 
you they want they'll literally say we want you to have charity status mm-hmm. in order to apply for this grant. And if you don't have it, there's no point in even looking at the grant. Yeah. You know. Now there there are ways of getting around that by piggybacking yeah. societies together, you know, that have similar modus operandi, similar things yeah. and similar intent that then you can find some sort of, you know, symbiosis between the two to make yeah. it work, right? Yeah. So th- so the breakdown then is your charity is almost an add-on to the society from the federal legisl- exactly. f- from the federal side of CRA. Yeah. So how then would a society become a foundation? Because you need the charity status, don't do you not, in order to become a foundation? Well, if you're going to become a foundation, I would probably if that was ultimately your ultimate aim, I would say don't start as a society, don't waste your time that's, there, go straight right. and set up as a part nine company, yeah. and yep. then establish yourself that way. Don't don't waste your time doing the wrong things in terms, you know. And this is this is what it comes down to when you, with most people with startups and everything else is. You try, okay, what is your ultimate aim? Where do you want to go? Yeah. And then start to make the, for the proper first steps to get to that aim. Mm-hmm. If you don't, you're going to be wasting a lot of time. Yeah. A lot of people say, oh, yeah, just set up as a society. And then you go like, why didn't you tell me about part nines and all yeah. this other stuff before? And you've wasted my money. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I think, yeah. And then break down part nine. We can go from part nine to charity status to foundation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So those are squared. That's a squared. So that's the that's the nonprofit side of the world. So let's talk about the the profit side, right? Yeah. And this is the fun stuff because this is the money makers. Yeah. Um. So, I I, I love people when they they talk about their businesses that they have, and they always say, "Oh yes, we have a business. You know, I you know I have a partner. You know, a partner uh, partner in my business. You know." And I said, "Well, you're, how are you set up? Or we're a corporation? Okay. Do you have a partnership or a corporation?" Yeah. And this is one thing that's always used to bug me, and, and I used to drill this in my students to make sure they understood the difference between a sole prop, a sole proprietor, mm-hmm. a partnership, and a corporation. Now, the fourth one, as we talked about, too, a little bit of the cat out of the back, yeah. um, is, <laughs> is the joint ventures. Yeah. yeah. And so let's, so let's... So would that be considered a cooperative? No, Co- 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 cooperative. Okay. Cooperative is a whole other different thing. So okay. we'll, we'll talk about cooperatives at the end. So let, okay. let's run through these these main things of how you can structure yourself to make money. Awesome. Now the key thing is everyone uh, when people come in and say, "Well, I could start. You could start this way as a sole proprietorship or a partnership." And I go, "Okay, what exactly are you doing?" Because I usually want to ask them, "Okay, I want to find out what extent of liability they may incur." Yeah. In other words, which way do I need to go to cover their ass? Right. Yeah. That's yeah. what I need to do. So, uh, if you don't have a lot of liability, things like that, and most people start off as a sole proprietorship, that's a single person doing business, carrying out business under their own name or a business name. Mm-hmm. Now, you can register a business name. So, say Fred's Fine Fish, right? Yeah. So I, I set up a fish, a fish and chip shop, as Fred's Fine Fish. I use that as my business name. You know, it's we we see this, you know, listed where people say, you know, so and so operating as Fred's Fine Fish. Yeah. So that's a sole proprietorship. But the problem is with a sole prop, it's only an individual. Yeah. Now, what if you bring in somebody else? Yeah. Ah, that's when you've now become a part. You've jumped to a partnership. Yeah. Now, a pro- the thing is with a partnership. You can end up, partnerships are usually a creature of a contract between the two parties. And usually the idea is uh, you can have an implied partnership. So say two people come together and they say, hey, guess what? Hey, I got this idea for making money. So we, they say to each other, yeah, let's make money. You know, we'll split profits. You know, we'll split profits after expenses. Yeah. You have, just by implication, never signing any contract, never doing anything. Guess what? You've created a partnership. That's right. Now... In a partnership, under the Partnership Act, oh, yeah, we're back to statutes and legislation, Kenny. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, under the Partnership Act, there are certain obligations of each partner. So, once you start to get into that role of creating a partnership, now each partner has certain obligations, certain duties, certain That's things, right. duty to account to the other partner. You know, you can't suddenly, you know, screw the other, part, the other partner and start doing things on the side that the other partner doesn't know about, even That's though right. it's using the same... It, that's. That's where things get really pissy between partners. And I've seen that happen quite a number of times. Well, um, we, we were just talking a little while ago about how uh, you think a divorce is bad. Check out when lawyers 
Oh, yes. Separate partnership. It's I, I know it of is one the very worst thing to ever watch in the world in court, man. I it's know horrible. of one very nasty one that occurred, and I was coming in at the tail end of it when it first came to Edmonton in 2000. And I won't mention the firms, and I won't, yeah. Be, but yeah, it was a very nasty divorce. You know, yeah. down to who owns what artwork in the firm. Oh God, yeah, it yeah. was like that bad. Yeah, but let, let's get back to partnerships. So, with a partnership, it's two or more people acting in concert with the, the the view of making a profit. That's the interesting part of it, with a view to making a profit. You don't have to actually make a profit, but yeah. The, it's the view of making a profit ultimately. So that's partnerships. But and they also share the liability now. That's the key thing, right? Their assets are covered. That's right. Now, with a corporation, uh, now we get to the corporation. Corporations are what we call a legal entity. That's right. Or they're a legal personality. They, are a cre- they were created by statute. Now, I'm going to ask you a quiz time. <laughs> What is the oldest company that you know of still extant in Canada? Hudson's Bay. Uh, thank you, yeah. Kenny. Bam! Tom Marks. Yeah. So how was, the, how was the Hudson's Bay Company formed? It was actually formed by a statute by the British Parliament. So a whole bunch of the guys, they wanted to get together. Here's the history. They wanted to get together, a whole bunch of guys. They said, hey, guess where we can find beaver pelts? Oh, in Canada. Well, that could be really dangerous and costly, and we might lose our shirts on this one. So let's go to the parliament and ask them to create a corporation such that our, we have limited liability so that if things go you know, sideways, we only lose what we put into it. So if I put in 10,000 pounds, I only lose 10,000 pounds. So, so chime in. This is where media companies want to be. Yeah. You want to be a corporation. You and don't want to hold liability yourself. Do you want, oh, oh, no, I, I'm going to digress for a second on a story on that one, and here's why. One, um, I knew years ago uh, a company or two people wanted to set up a, um, a blog site. It was a political blog site. And they were worried about some liability issues and everything else. So I actually set them up as a corporation. We eventually did move the server to Panama. <laughs> yeah. That was fun. And we did that one. But we set, up a, we set them up as a corporation. Guess what you can't sue a corporation for? Opinions. Def- defamation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, defamation. So it, we yeah. Really st- it, 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 it completely messed up the other side when they caught this. And they went, oh, crap. And they went, Yes, yeah. gotcha. And uh, so that's kind of the, uh, but the idea of corporations is it does protect you from liability. How does it do it? Here's the detail of it. And I won't get into the, the famous Donahue and Stevenson case and the ginger beer bottle and everything else. Like, I can do an entire I did actually about read it. that case about the ginger beer bottle. Oh, you sent me that. Yes, but yeah, that's, I did that's read the that. fun one. Um, yeah. I always have fun with that one because that actually started the whole issue of limited liability. And it actually is based off of Scots law. Sorry, English. It wasn't your idea to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> it was the Scots. We figured it out first. Nah, nah. <laughs> so... Um, what what the what a corporation does is it creates limited liability because it separates the day to day workings from the ownership. That's right. And the owners are the shareholders. So yep. the shareholders elect the directors, and they say to the directors, "You go do the work. Yeah. You pay us the dividends, and as long as we're getting money, we're happy, happy." Mm-hmm. So the idea was as a cre- it was a, originally Hudson's Bay was created. Uh, created as a, cor- as a corporation, but it was established by parliament. Most corporations at that time had to be. Later on, we get Corporations Act, and basically it's now become a system of registration. Yeah. So you basically have to find a name for the company, or you can set up as a numbered company. And Do, do the listeners want to know the difference between a name and a numbered company? Let's go in there. Okay, about 400 cool. bucks? Uh, no, actually, <laughs> it's about the same, actually, yeah. unfortunately. Oh, okay. So a number company is basically you just get the next number up on the sequence. Yeah. And if you have a name company, you have to go through and do a nuance search, which yeah. is 75 newly upgraded. Bucks. 75, you have to do a search of all other similar names yeah. so that you pick a name that will not cause confusion with another extant company. And you also have to do this uh, when you incorporate a not-for-profit. Yep. Yeah. And and part of it too, when you do a nuance search uh, to check for the names, you also get the trademarks. That's right. Ooh, we'll have to go back to trademarks eventually in protecting yeah. information. Yeah. So that's 
you know, that's what you do when you set up a company. So then you would have the directors, the shareholders, the shareholders would elect the directors, the directors would elect the officers. What are the officers? President, the treasurer, the secretary. That's yeah. their basis of it. Now, the officers can then hire an executive director. That's right. So they can carry to the exact director carries out the day to day stuff, and the directors, as the board, now have the oversight of the executive director. And ultimately, the, you have to have you know, directors' board meetings, you'll have shareholder annual general shareholders' meetings. Um, I won't get into some of the details in that, but that's basically what how you set up a company uh, or a corporation. Let me differ that from a company because we don't confuse with a part nine yeah. company. So corporations are basically now just a system of registration. And find a name, find it, you, you file the articles of incorporation, you file who the directors are, who the shareholders are, you, you, there's a whole bunch of paperwork. And generally, uh, two monkeys and a typewriter can do this, and yeah. it's not hard. Um, yeah. It's oh. just knowing what you're doing with it. Yeah. And I, I spend my time teaching people about it. You know, it's, it's literally people. like, copy paste this paragraph put it in and put your new numbers over on the left side of the column <laughs> and you let it run but yeah it's, it's it's about that simple yeah but the thing is it's knowing what paragraphs that's to right. copy where that's where the lawyer yeah. comes in to explain what why you're doing certain things yeah and sometimes you can put um limits on a corporation so it, in the schedules that are attached to the articles of incorporation, you might have a limit and say um, the company can only be involved in doing X product or X manufacturing of such and such, you know, widgets. Or you might put a limit on and say this company can only borrow up to 100000 or something. Like, so you have limits in terms of the corporation. Mm. But the idea of a corporation is to try and create some sort of limited liability. However, recent case law and the way things are going, uh, corporate, even though we have limited liability in corporations, corporate directors are still being held liable if they do not make decisions based on prudent director practice of a well-run company. You so know, break that down a little bit. Okay, basically don't run your company like Enron. Okay. Got it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that and, sort of thing. Uh, and you know, for those people who don't know what Enron is, what exactly did Enron do? A lot of really scuzzy things. Yeah, they sure did. <laughs> <laughs> they sure did. And they fucked over a lot of people. Oh yeah. <laughs> but the idea is, you, as a director, you, you're the company to to keep you know directors not having liability. They have to make sure that they act prudently, you know, reasonably. How you know they have to make they have to make decisions based on good practice. What other well-run companies are done. That's you know. If not, then they attract liability. Yeah. Um, we have recent cases in Alberta where. Um, companies that used to handle oil wells and orphaned oil wells and stuff, and they're not handling things. They didn't do the reclamation clean. correctly. They're not doing the reclamation correctly, so they're getting nailed for, for personal liability. Yeah, Oops. yeah. And then you have to go into your own pocket. Yep. Um, let's touch on corp corp uh, cooperative. Cooperative. So cooperatives are an interesting sort of creature, too, because uh, a cooperative is basically a, it's a group of people. It's set up by the members. So it's, it's derived for the benefit of the members and the membership. It, you know, some cooperatives run as a society which has membership, et cetera, these sort of things too. But it's basically, you, you can have different types of worker co uh, cooperatives, consumer cooperatives, product cooperatives, or multi-stakeholder uh, multi cooperatives and there, things. There's also housing. Yeah, and housing, housing yeah. cooperatives. You know, that would be, a, that would be kind of a multi-stakeholder type. Of yeah. the, that, I was just listing the four sort of general types of uh, categories. But the idea is it's basically run by the members, for the members, yeah. on behalf of the members, in terms of trying to, you know, as you said, cooperative housing, these sort of things that yeah. come up. That's a good example. Or even when we go to the co-op gas station, mm -hmm. that's a cooperative of a bunch of people who basically wholesaled the cost of gas. Yep. And if you own a membership as a cab driver for, let's say, co-op cab, yep. you get a discount on that gas yep. if you're a cooperative member of the co-op co-op gas yeah right and at the end of the year generally you get like a, a dividend. dividend check yeah, yeah. Uh, we yeah i get that one because i've been a member of the co-op on the trail yeah and, yeah yeah yeah, and yeah that one and you know i uh, that's you know i think co-ops and stuff actually i always have fun with that co-op because 
when I go in there, I always see interesting things. Like on one side, they have like Edmonton Eskimos jerseys, and then they also have Saskatchewan Rough Riders. <laughs> <laughs> because the co- who start? Where did the co-op start? Yeah, Saska, right? Yeah, so it, yeah. It, kind of inter- interesting thing to see. See, they're still holding to their their uh, their history and stuff. Their roots. Like, in their, exactly, exactly. So I think we've we've broken down the articles of incorporation, so to say. Yeah. Let's go to when to use a non-disclosure agreement and trademarks. Because I feel like those two could be lumped in together. The answer is every time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this gets me into such an interesting area. Um, I'm going to give a little history of a case I worked on. I've got to be careful what I say on this one. Um, when I first came to Edmonton, I ended up working as a legal researcher as part of the litigation team. And we were litigating the hell out of a company that was for a breach of confidential business information. And that's, the, I'll get into the whole realm of how you protect your ideas and what you're doing, and et cetera. But really all comes down to this whole area of confidential business information and protecting it. So basically what happened was this guy had derived, figured out how to use this product as a truck bed liner and how to make it uh, stick to auto paint. So uh, one drunken night, he uh, blabbed to a bunch of other guys even the detail of how to do it. Oops. He basically created his own competition. And that's why you want to be careful in terms of this confidential business information. Mm -hmm. Um, Suffice it to say, it was a very interesting case because also part of it was they enticed, once they now understood how to do it, they enticed this guy to go and work for them, which became a breach of an employment contract, and they induced a breach of an employment contract, and they got sued for that as well. So there's a whole, there was a whole bunch of interesting things that happened in that regard. But what's this confidential business information? God, it's such a fun area. So in our modern sense, I've always said the... It, it's it's the ideas that are in your brain are what make money, right? It was your idea when you started this podcast for doing stuff. And, and, and it's, it's also, I guess this is the other piece too, because we this whole entire month was startups with entrepreneurs, right? So entrepreneurs and we, I sat down with um, Ameth uh, Pratap, Hi. who has ran many businesses within the Edmonton area. Yeah. And uh, he was basically saying, you know, he so he's an underwriter of insurance, mm-hmm. right? So that's that's where his and uh, realtor, so on and so forth. So that's where his business sense had started from. But what he was basically saying is, we entrepreneurs have all these ideas all day long. What we never know how to do is get them off the ground. How do you incorporate? What's the best incorporation to use? So on and so forth. The the vehicle. What's your vehicle going to be? That's that's the vehicle, but it's protecting the idea to begin with, right? And this is where you get into the whole intellectual property area of, Copyright, trademarks, industrial design, patents, these sort of things. Yeah. And, and the, the, for, the other part, the fifth part I always talk about is, intell- is the in, in confidential business information. Yeah. So what is C, uh, what we call CBI? Now, CBI is that whole area of the information, the idea that we figure out, hey, we can make money off of this. Yeah. Now, we differentiate CBI, or confidential business information, from trade secrets. Yeah. Trade secrets are the actual methodologies and how we That's go right. about it and do things. Like if I were yeah. to ex- explain how we market the podcast, mm-hmm. that would be our trademark secrets. Well, not you're, now you're, you're talking two different things. Your trademark is the name, right? Yes. This, it's, the confi- it's the confidential business information is how I use life on life terms, which is the trademark, yeah. In terms of the other, the background, and you kind of like the sausage making factory thing. Okay. Of how we do and make the money in the background. Okay. So, let's let's add humans. Yeah, add humans <laughs> <laughs> and stir. <laughs> so, um, CB, so CBI, um, CBI is basically anything. It's the idea, but it's because I keep it secret. I keep it confidential. And it's the nature of that confidentiality, and it allows me to make money. Yeah. Let me give you an example. I'm, I'm such a geek. One of the things I always like watching is how it's made, right? Yeah, the, yeah. You know, manufacturing process. So let me give you an example. Um, vacuum, plastic form, uh, vacuum molding, right? And say uh, you have a company that makes vacuum molds and stuff out of plastics. Okay. So you find out there's this new type of plastic out there 
that people want to work with. So you spend time figuring out how to work with it, trying to work out the time, the temperatures, the pressures and stuff that has to be worked at to make things properly such that they won't blow <coughs> apart or fall apart or, you know, basically go kaboom when you don't want them to. Yeah. So you spend time, money, and effort blowing through the material, learning how to work with it. Yeah. You now have confidential business information yeah, yeah. on the time, the temperature, the pressures, and how to work yeah. with it, right? Yeah. What happens if, if you find out these trade secrets while working with somebody else? Uh, let's talk about employee inventory rights and all the other stuff. That would be an entirely other lecture, actually, at this point. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it comes down to, I can explain it this way. Um, the idea is, if you have worked out how to work with, say, a material, and you now keep secret, you keep confidential that information on how to do it, that allows you to make money because now that you know how to do it quickly and cheaply means that now you can, you know, people can come to you and you can say, um, you know, I need this such and such manufactured using this product. And you say, okay, it'll cost X amount. It mm. might be cheaper than everybody else who has not figured out how to do it. Yeah. Now, if they have figured out how to do it using their own time, their materials, et cetera, et cetera, then that's legit. You know, they then have their confidential business information. Yeah. But it, it comes down to have they, has, say, the other company figured out how to do it by what we call normal means. Now, normal means being taking the time and effort to do exactly the same thing the first guy did. Yeah. And yeah. now he's worked out how to do it cheaply so he can underbid everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. So he has, so let, let me get into the detail of this. So he has that information. He has that confidential information, the trade secrets of the time, the pressures, and all the other stuff, and the te you know temperatures, etc. So he can now work with the stuff. He, as long as he takes steps to protect that information, mm -hmm. you know, it's only known by limited key employees. It's only known by limited stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Or only two people happen to know each half of the Coca-Cola formula. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. by the way, it is true with Coca-Cola formula. The early ones. It cocaine. did have cocaine in it. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Go read um, a book called Molecules and uh, yeah. Molecules and Exhibition. It talks all about that. That's like Fanta. If you yeah. look at Fanta, why was Fanta created? It was because Nazi Germany wasn't yep. able to get cola. Yeah. So they created their own, and that's yeah. where Fanta is actually Nazi uh, Nazi Nazi money, money. that started yeah. it. Yeah. Wow. That's that's how that started. Yeah. Yeah. Same as Volkswagen, but yeah. we can go into that whole yeah. realm of Volkswagen as yeah. well. So that's. So we're talking about CBI. So that's confidential business information. And it's because of the, it's the nature of the information and how I keep it confident, confidential that allows me to make money. Those kind of, that triangle of, of, of bits and pieces allows me to protect that information. Yeah, that's right. But let's talk about the other information you want to protect when you're starting up too. You mentioned uh, trademarks, mm -hmm. okay? So say I have an idea. So uh, I can protect a trademark and a name. Yeah. Or a trademark. Or a trademark is the image. A trade name is the actual wording. You know, kind of like the, the trademark might be the image of Nike with the swoosh, right? Yeah. The uh, trade name might be the name like Exxon, you yeah. know, the company. Uh, by the way, Exxon, you know, is actually a made-up name. Really? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, they, they, came out, they came up with it, you know. I don't know. Maybe a couple of lines were done. Anyway, um, <laughs> but... <laughs> I, I, in Nicaragua? Oh, yeah. You never know. <laughs> so um, I think with, with this, um, trademarks is the actual name or the, the brand and stuff, how you want to, to be known as. What are you protecting with the trademark? You're protecting... The, the key with the trademark is it creates goodwill because when you see, like, the Nike swoosh or the Adidas or something like that, or, um, say, the BMW... Um, logo or you know mercedes logo or these sort of things right you see those images you know automatically the company and what they do and what they yeah, make yeah by the way do you ever know uh, the uh, that uh, mercedes and bmw you know those logos do you know what they actually or the origins of them are no oh take a look at them again don't they look like propellers Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because what the companies actually used to make was aircraft engines. 
Yeah, Same yeah, as yeah. Mitsubishi. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mit, Mitsubishi is, it means diamond, right? And, yeah. you know, Mitsubishi, they used to make the Japanese Zero aircraft. Yeah. So each one of them has, as their trademarks, these logos that are harken back to the history of them being aircraft engine manufacturers. So a uh, little, little uh, history that I learned was um, the two first sitcom shows that ever started advertising in a nonchalant way. So they would, one was Roseanne. Mm-hmm. The f- big one, though, was Seinfeld. So when you looked at Seinfeld's um, cereal boxes, yep. they were selling that as advertising. Yep. And then there was a time when George Costanza, there was an episode where he had the, believe it or not, George. Is, so he did yep. that whole jingle, right? But where that came from in the previous episode was they went, ba da bum 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 I'm loving it. And yeah. that's, that's where that came from. And then the other one was, by Menon. It's like it's like you're by men in, yeah. and that's all back to where Liam is coming from with the image. It's the image, and and what it does is it, it, you 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 hear it, you see these things, you automatically asso- you automatically associate yeah. the product and the stuff with the people and the group and the company, etc. So and, but that's what we call goodwill, and that's what you're ultimately trying to protect is you're trying to protect the goodwill of the company. So, so why McDonald's tries to protect its goodwill in the name, etc., yeah. and they tried to sue McDonald's fine furniture in Victoria yeah, one yeah, year, yeah, yeah. and that whole well that didn't pan out too well for mcdonald's they lost that one but so i guess that one of the a guy could say that you're almost protecting your subliminal your subliminal commercialization exactly but if what you're you're, what you're protecting is how that name or image that logo associates to your product or service it's like the the ding of your bell exactly yeah and and people see it you know as i said you know when people see like a mercedes or a bmw logo they know or a nike swoosh they know exactly the quality and type of the product yeah that's what you're creating that's what you're trying it's that association okay so um that's trademarks and stuff out of the way um oh by the way actually i should say that was actually my um my master's thesis Oh, it was yeah. on trademarks and domain names and the interjurisdictional treatment. So if you Google it. Liam Connolly, you will get that paper. You'll probably find that paper. Yeah, I you'll wrote find it my somewhere. master's paper. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where did you write your master's? Um, Buckingham University in England. There Actually, you go. I did. I did my master's degree in nine months. I, what? I just like nonstop and just kept going at what it. What kind of drugs were you on, man? <laughs> <laughs> I know it would have I taken me a lot of cocaine. Fifth. I plead the fifth. <laughs> it would have taken me a hell of a lot of cocaine, I'll tell you that. Yep. Well, I think we're all sober now. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we, we keep it within the family. Yep. Right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to all you pride maniacs out there, we can keep it in the family. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's let's segue a little bit into how to protect your ideas, because I okay. think that's... Yeah, and, and but well, one of the things is well, let, let's talk then how you do it through um, copyright, creating a trademark, okay. protecting copyright, industrial designs and patents, and and also like how you do it through non-disclosure agreements. You got well, it. We'll turn, we'll end off with those. So, um, say you have an idea, um, you have an idea for a new contact lens case. So you come up with this idea. And you say, hey, so you start building it. Ooh, I start building it. I have a prototype. Yeah. I have a model. So I then put um, little eyelashes and designs on that model that, you know, it's kind of like um, a uh, contact lens case with bubbles on the top, and you, you paint little eyes on it. And so you come up with a name for this. You call it Easy Eyes. Yeah. So the idea is you've created a contact lens case that makes sure that the lenses stay in position they don't invert they don't mess up you know they can stay you know stable so then you decide oh wait a second i'm going to write up a business plan for this whole this product and i'm going to go about marketing and selling it hmm so what have i now created well in the business plan the write-up i've created copyright copyright is something that comes into existence the moment you put figure to keyboard or pen to paper you put something in a hard copyable form um the um patent is when you have um, an actual working model of something. It is something that has a function, not in, and it's useful. We, and, and there's all sorts of details in terms of patents. Um, patent is something that is functional, it's useful, and it's not obvious. You know, yeah. It's not an obvious development from something else. So you can register that and you can then get protections for it for a number of years. I'm not going to go into the details of years, but it's a system where you have to register it to get the protection. Yeah. So the trademark, hmm, 
I come up with the logo in the name Easy Eyes. So then I go and I check and make sure and see nobody else has ever created something similar. I can then register that as a trademark. I can then keep that trademark for a number of years and I can renew it a number of times. Yeah. You can only renew it about three times and then you're done. Uh, then you kind of have to rejig your, your, your trademark. Um, the copy, back to the copyright. Copyright in the business plan. I've now created a write-up on something. Um, the brochures, you know, when I go to talk to people about it, mm-hmm. then those brochures I- attract copyright. That's right. I, as I have a right, and I've, um, I have a right to protect that copyright and that, you know, the wording. And, and, and copyright protects the expression, not the idea. Yeah, yeah. So um, how do I explain that one? Okay, quiz time again. So copyright protects the uh, expression, not the idea. That's right. What's the difference? Okay, three movies. My Fair Lady, Princess Diaries, and Shrek. What do they all have in common? Princess. No. No. They all do have a princess, though. Yeah, they all have a princess, (laughs) but but what's the common theme? Uh, I couldn't tell you. Okay, think about it. Ugly Duckling makes good, right? Each one, right? okay. Okay, so that's the idea. But if copyright protected the idea, you would have stopped at My Fair Lady and the other two movies could never have been made. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's each one is a different expression of that idea. I think Walt Disney owns all of that. Yeah, but they only protect the expression. Anybody oh. else can come up with the idea of a similar story, right? You know, think, think of Star Wars. Star Wars is nothing more than a morality play with an underlying theme, right? Yeah. You could you could almost put you know Shakespeare's Richard the Third in there as a plot line, that's and like, it still works, right? It's that's com- that's yeah. the idea. But the Star Wars as the movie is the expression of that sort of morality play of good versus evil, et cetera, et cetera. That's right? like I've noticed in the sober world or even the um, self help world. How many times has the big book almost been reiterated? Yeah. Many, many times, yeah. yet they, their diagnosis of doing the work is a little bit different. Yeah. So, so it, the work is a little bit different. However, the literature itself is pretty well reiterated, not word for word, but damn near close word for word. Yeah. Well, it's, like the, it's the same thing, going to a bookstore. You ever looked at how many cookbooks there are? Yeah. Because each one's a different expression. You can come up with, you know, same recipes, but different expression. That's you can, right. You can reiterate and, and not be, have copyright infringement. Well, that's right. Uh, you can sometimes come close, but you got to watch things. So that's copy- Change your it's and as. Yeah. So that's kind of like, <laughs> in, in a nutshell, that's copyright. So we've covered copyright, trademark, patents. Industrial design. Let's go to that one finally. Industrial design is, well, remember we said patents. The, the object has to have a function. Yeah. What if it just looks pretty? It's like a pattern, say, um, it's like a um, shape of a bottle, or it's the, um, the uh, pattern for a um, uh, wallpaper or something like that, right? Okay. So, um, or it's the, the actual logo badge on the car. Okay. It just looks pretty. It has no function for the car. You know, it doesn't help yeah. the car go faster. It just, but, but it just says pr- to protect and serve. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> those are the badges we watch out for yeah um, <laughs> um <laughs> D- doesn't make it go faster, faster. but <laughs> it's there <laughs> it just sends another message <laughs> so um industrial design is is basically you know that 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 the pattern, the, co- the the color, the logo, it's it's something, it's it's not functional, but it just looks pretty. So, Easy Eyes. Remember I said she drew like what looked like eyelashes yeah. on the thing? That's industrial design. That's okay. part of it, right? So, you can protect that. So, how once you, you so you've come up with, you know, your working model, you've done your, um, your business plan, you've got a trademark, you've got industrial design. So how do you protect all this? So say you want to go talk to investors and stuff, but you don't want them to steal your idea. Yeah. So this is where we have non-disclosure agreements. And non-disclosure agreements come in two forms. There are bilateral and unilateral. Yeah. So unilateral is, I'm just telling something to you, and therefore you have to keep it secret, et cetera. Yeah. If, say, um, we're doing a joint venture, and we're both sharing information. Yeah. Then we end up in a situation where we'll do a bilateral di- a non-disclosure agreement 
because we're exchanging information. And these non-disclosure agreements allow you to share that information safely, mm -hmm. knowing that if the other side tries to steal it and take it, you can kick their butt. Yeah, that's right. So um, I'm going to give you, there was an interesting case in Canada. And I actually have a little bit of history to this case because I heard about this case even before it ever got started. It's called Lack Minerals in Corona Mines. Okay. And one of my profs at the time, in undergrad, uh, his father was actually working on this. And he started talking to me one day in, in his office. We were chatting about this. And he told me some of the, the facts of the situation, what was going on. And I said, oh, we were just talking about some, something similar like that in trust and stuff and fiduciary duties in Margaret Ogilvie's class. And he went, oh, wait a second. So I said, it sounds like they breached their fiduciary duty on this one under the non-disclosure agreements. Facts of the case, really wild. So these two mining companies decide, hey, they found this, um, uh, I think it was a silver, uh, silver stream um, in some place in northern Ontario. And they, one company said, hey, this is bigger than us. So they decide to team up with the other company. So this is how Lack Minerals and Corona Mines come together yeah. to work on this. And they were trying to, there was discussions between the directors at the time, all subject of non-disclosure agreements, et cetera, et cetera. And what happened was Corona Mines, the, some of the directors decided, hey, this, this, this ore seam might go down through this other property. So they decided to go and register a claim to work this other section property that was adjoining where the original discussions were talking, were taking place. Yeah. About. So the, the joint venture starts to move forward, and they said, hey, you know, this, they start to figure out, too, this is bigger. And they said, why don't we also make a claim to these other areas? And they got down there, and they looked, and they went, oh, who are these two people? And the guys at Lack Minerals looked at uh, the names and said, aren't those the directors of Corona Mines? Assholes. And that was what sparked the whole lawsuit, oh because my. the directors had personally benefited from the information that had been disclosed to them sure confidentia yeah. and confidentially. Now, this is sometimes subject of, of non-disclosure agreements and everything else, too. There is uh, another way that information and stuff can be protected, and this actually applies more in uh, journalism and media stuff when we get into it, is what we call them uh, the Wigmore criteria, mm -hmm. um, where, uh, say, somebody tells you some information that is with an air of confidence about it and they're telling it because they need you to know so say a journalist and a, a source and a journalist yeah so um say the the source and it's a relationship that we want to foster we want to be able to, that sources can tell stuff to journalists and yeah. be protective so it's a relationship we want to protect but it's a relationship based on trust that the source is giving the confidential information to the journalist, it's an air of, you know, be careful who you tell, right? Yeah. But, uh, and I want to make, make sure that we maintain this. So the question becomes at the end, though, when can such information be disclosed legitimately? And this is what we get into in the Wigmore, uh, Wigmore criteria, and it's the fourth part of the, the criteria, where if it's needed that in the public interest, it's better that the public know that that about the information rather than it be protected then it's okay to disclose the information i see and i i've seen situations and all sorts of stuff um do you remember oh ages ago what's his name i uh, wrote that book about brian uh, brian mulrooney and I can't remember. okay and there was a lot of stuff in that and at the time um, the, the, Brian was not happy about it because they disclosed certain information about the Airbus contracts, etc. Oh, yeah, that yeah, also yeah, yeah. got Brian right. Now, yeah. So I remember one of it was actually it was QR seventy seven. It was one of my students was actually one of the producers of one of the shows down in QR seventy seven. So they phoned me up and said, Liam, we know you know all about this stuff in Wigmore and all the confidential. So I came out and talked about that, and I basically said at the time I said Brian's got a pretty decent case. You know, the question is. You know, 
was it important that the public know yeah. about what was going on yeah. right, with these sort of things. So it, it gets in, you know, that you can use non-disclosure stuff, you have issues, and that gets into lack minerals, corona mines, and all this stuff. You get the Wigmore criteria. But ultimately, there are ways of doing this properly such that you can take your idea and go to people and talk to them about it and get investors, just get people interested, yeah. and do it properly so that if they do blab or they do try to steal it, you can sue their butt. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think... I. Well... So I'll preface with this is I know with us here on the podcast, we do have or we have had um, anonymous guests Mm -hmm. on the show. And that being said, so on our um, disclosure, basically when you say we can air this, the only way how you can really pull back your uh, consent, so to say, is if your life is in jeopardy. Yeah. And uh, there actually was a case like that um, yeah. where, um, I'll, I'll give you the this, this scenario, a lady was a witness to a murder, and uh, the media lot interviewed her. Uh, they didn't, block, they didn't uh, pixelate her face or distort her voice. They actually broadcast the interview. She gave the interview saying, yeah, she had seen the, wit- seen the person yeah. and knew exactly who he was, and they broadcast it. She tried to stop them broadcasting it because what when she gave the interview, she didn't realize that the accused was getting was sti- No, he was still out. Oh my god! He 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 hadn't been <laughs> caught yet. Stop and the plugs. <laughs> yeah. So he he ba- she they they basically broadcast. She tried to get them to stop bro- the broadcast of this because she and she said, "No, my life is in danger." Yeah. They broadcast it anyway because they said, by virtue of you doing the interview, you consented. Well, here's the catch. The consent can be revoked. Yeah, yeah. And this is where the media screwed up on this one. It went, they, she actually did sue them. It started a statement of claim, went to court. It got settled out of court. Yeah. So it was, a, it was one of those ones where we got no judicial reasoning on it. But it was one of the early cases where basically we looked at, yeah, this was a tort of breach of privacy of the person. Well, and I, th- and I, think, I think even for media, like for media or podcasting companies or podcasting uh, ventures, what you need to protect is this that's happening right now. Yeah. This is our product. Yeah. This is the product, right? So if we had people coming in mm-hmm. three, four times a week and they sat down here and we did the two or three hour uh, conversation conversations with them and then all of a sudden they said, well, I revoke. I revoke consent. I don't like what I said, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. We could then in turn, and I'm saying this for any other podcaster because we totally endorse any podcast to start, mm-hmm. but this is where you have to be cautious is you have to be able to say, okay, so show me how it's in jeopardy and you need to go talk to our lawyer. Yeah. And our lawyer is going to be the one who makes that judgment call because it's basically up to the lawyer is, is he going to win that litigation? Yeah. Or is he not going to win that litigation? Yeah. And we have to make sure, you know, is this person's life in jeopardy? And if it is, yeah, or if there's certain things that could happen, yeah, maybe we come back and we maybe distort the voice. We change things such yeah. that the idea is you cannot be, you know, you're anonymous, you cannot be identified. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you want to say certain things, but you don't want to be identified. Now, later on, you know, we do have information where then we're kind of caught by the Wigmore criteria in terms of things where... Is is in the public need or certain things we m- might have to disclose it, but we only take that and say you know, I would probably say if that's going to happen, get a court order, please. And 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 let's yeah. let's let, you know, look at this and say you know we won't release it, but get a court order to say we need to to open it up in case you need it. So now so, something similar I learned to this in the engineering world. So gradu- graduated school, whatever, went off to a big corporation, big fancy corporation called Stantec. And uh, Stantec, we were, I was on the geomatic side. So here in Alberta, uh, the majority of the geomatic engineers have to hold 51% of that entity so that... Um, 51% of that entity so that they that the Alberta Land Surveyors Committee knows that the ethics are being utilized within that company, okay? So long story short, what what uh, Stantec used to do with us is they used to do this. They used to, uh, they used to say to us, um, whatever it is, whatever it is that you've learned here through the corporate structure, you're allowed to take with you. 
So like, for instance, I got to sit down with some pretty big, I would, I would say influential business people. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when you're talking about negotiating, they're going to show you the way that they negotiate because they want Stantec to win all of the time. Right. So as they're sitting there teaching you this, sure, you have your practice as in a surveyor. That's that's fine. You learn that stuff in school. But what these people are teaching you is a whole new ball game of business. OK. And so what they would actually allow you because they would tell you, we're not going to give you the salary that you're looking for. You're probably worth five, six hundred grand a year. We don't have that kind of money. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to give you 150,000, pay your tuition off and 150,000 taxes paid. And we're going to teach you how to negotiate and win a contract. Yeah. And when you're ready to leave, you can take those skill set. But that company that you're going to can't get you to write it down. You're allowed to utilize it as in a practice. But you can't write it down. Now, that's an interesting one because that gets into the whole realm of employment law and stuff. And actually, I'd like to leave that as like, I, I'll, I'd like to come back and talk yeah. about that whole issue and talk about employee inventory's rights and talk about that situation too. Because um, with that one, if, say, you were a key employee, you you can't take certain things away with you. You can take general stuff about yeah. the business, but any crucial information, say, uh, client lists, client yep. pricing, things like that, you can't use. That's right. Um, that gets into what we what we uh, affectionately call the chicken case. Yeah, that's right. And and where that goes. And the chicken case was the famous one about Facenta Chicken, and the person decided to set up a whole new company. He was a driver. He knew all the clients, how many chickens they took, what pricing, etc. And he decided to do it on his own. He unfortunately got caught. Yeah, yeah. And you can't do it. But that the, the difference is between an average employee and a key employee. Key employees yeah, yeah. will know certain specific things. That's right. And they can't take it away. That's right. And then this gets into what we call um, in the employment contracts on the confidentiality agreements, et cetera, and the restrictive covenants and what you can do and where you can go afterwards. Yeah. And I can say this, when, when I'm drafting employment contracts, I find the interesting part is I, I always ask, you know, when it comes to restrictive covenants, and I, I, can, I actually have done it such that I say, okay, who are your competitors? And I say, those are the complete places that this employee cannot go and work for for six months. Ah, I see, I see. And that way I make the restrictive covenant reasonable, which is yeah, yeah. legitimate. Yeah. I can't stop you from working. Yeah. That's not allowed. But I can stop you doing certain things and taking my information yeah. that, you know, can be useful for another company. It's like government government workers and stuff, right? Uh, you, you have to, you can't do any contracts or something with the government for right. a year, you know, until afterwards, because then your information becomes absolutely useless. That's right. A year later. Right. So you have that sort of aspect to also get, get into as well. But uh, that, that I'd like to leave for a whole other show and talk about the employment law side of things that I deal with. So, so I, th I think the last question that we had is why is a corporate, why is a corporate lawyer so necessary for a startup? And I think you proved that. Thank you. Liam so Connolly I, uh, at yeah. Connolly Law. All your Canadian <laughs> law, real estate. So I think Liam Connolly at Connolly we're, law. We're, uh, <laughs> we're at the, the tail end of the show. So um, I'd like to do a bit of shout out too yeah, in terms sure. of my stuff. Um, so I also teach for Athabasca University yeah. and I also sit on the Board of Governors for the university. Uh, so if anybody's interested, both I have my, my legal services and my, as my practice, yeah. but if you're ever interested, I do teach courses in media law, media ethics, business yeah. law. Um, employment law, uh, labor relations, uh, these sort of things. So if anybody wants to ever take some of these courses that we teach, um, please come and see us. So because, we'll, what we know. can do too on Life on Life's Terms is at the end of our blog, mm -hmm. what we'll do is we'll put a, a ready link mm -hmm. that'll go to wherever you want it to go. So any of the listeners, if they want to go right to the ready link, they just have to copy, uh, copy it, paste it, put it in a in a search engine yep. and off they go and they'll, yep. they'll see all this stuff yep. that you're talking about. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get that from you uh, for sure so that they can, they can see that. Yep. Uh, we would love to be able to put it in all the other forums of, of the, the apps. Yeah. However, the apps don't allow us to do that. They call it a copyright issue now. Um, that just, that just started happening. I can't even do that on YouTube. Yep. Even if you give me a bloody uh, consent saying that you want it there, YouTube it, still doesn't give a shit. Yeah, and it completely flies in the face of the issues around links and what yeah. the, the, and the, the legal jurisprudence on linking yeah. and stuff these days. And yeah, so we can get into those uh, topics and issues on the next show. 
uh, next time we 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 do something of this yeah. um, of this magnitude. Yeah. But if Kenny would like to wrap it up, unless you have something else. Well, I was going to say, yeah, when we get into the employment law, so I can start to talk about the stuff and tell them when you can actually do the Johnny paycheck line. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I want to. I see only sure. many people. Goog- <laughs> I see people now googling that on YouTube. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jo- it's Johnny called paycheck. a song called "Take That Job and Shove It." Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I'd like to thank you for coming in. Uh, I, I would suspect that our listeners are just as happy that you came in and, and disclosed this information I, to them. I wrote more notes while he was talking than any other guest that we've had. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. So did I tell you there's now going to be a quiz? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. I'm ready to go. Good. Yeah, yeah. All right, Kenny, let's wrap it up. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, please subscribe and share it to all your friends. You can find the After the Show blog on our website, www.lifeonlifestermspodcast.com. Sorry, <laughs> screwed up there. Uh, and you can also become a financial contributor. We do have a Patreon page. It's www.patreon.com slash lifeonlifesterms with capital L's. And if you... Uh, Go to our blog page. We do not sell your email. That's how you become a Pride member. Um, We ask you for your email so that we can tell you all of the upcoming events and also all of the new shows and blogs coming out. But we do not sell your email to any of our sponsors even. So I make sure we do comply with all the privacy legislation in this province. (laughs) You got it. That's right. Have a good day, guys. Thanks for coming on. Have a beautiful day. Bye for now.